GTC Plaza and so forth. That's the area we're talking about right there. Only a couple doors away from Jacob Hart's house. I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know if he had an influence to say, well, I think we should go down to Second Street because it's, I'm getting older now. I don't can walk right over to the church. And so forth. <laughs> right there. Um, but it was the only one of the downtown Cedar Rapids churches that went in this direction. It was kind of unusual in that respect. And it ended up being, I'm, I'm afraid, a decision that was had to be changed again less than 30 years later and the reasoning why they came out here to 10th Street and 3rd Avenue was that Cedar Rapids was growing so quickly again Cedar Rapids growth is so tied in with the church development because every time the city starts growing the churches have to kind of accommodate the growth sometime all I can do is say PCI right <laughs> so you either have to kind of work with the development. This is not a new story for you guys. You guys had to deal with this before in 1881 uh, when the situation around you made you make a decision to go down to 2nd Street. And then something started happening around your second church location. When it was only 20 years old, the city made this glorious decision because we had so much industry and business happening in Cedar Rapids. We expanded the railroad lines. We had four major railroads here, the Illinois Central. Chicago Northwestern, the Rock Island, the Milwaukee. And you know what the railroads wanted? They wanted their own area of downtown where they could put up freight stations and have all these tracks coming in. Because think about all the packages we get now from FedEx and UPS. How do you think all that stuff used to come to Cedar Rapids? A train. It's an enormous amount of freight. So the city also needed a location for wholesale houses and warehouses and light industrial, smaller industrial. And they said, you know what? We're going to look at starting at 3rd Avenue. And everything from 3rd Avenue, they, they decreed this in 1898. They said everything from 3rd Avenue all the way down to 10th Avenue in what's now the Nouveau area and all the way over to the train tracks. Uh, in the next 10, 15 years, we have to wipe out everything. All the houses, if there's a church there, they all need to go because we need to put in freight train stations, large-scale warehouses to accommodate the wholesale trade for Cedar Rapids. And you see those buildings down there now. You see uh, the old Great Furniture Mart building. You see the... Water Tower Place, you see the Pepsi building, you see the Harper McIntyre building. Smulikoff's furniture store started out as a warehouse for wholesale drugs and grocery. And so all of a sudden First Lutheran realized that if they don't get a new location pretty soon, they're going to be in the middle of a warehouse district. Just like that. And the church was barely 20 years old when that happened. So let's kind of investigate this a little bit closer. There's a beautiful early shot, and look how peaceful and quiet that looks. When it locates on 2nd Street, it's surrounded by quiet residential houses. It seemed like the right decision at that time on 2nd Street right there. It did. And uh, that's one of the few images we have in the church. This is another one, kind of a frontal view. Beautiful brick structure. And every major early congregation in Cedar Rapids built what I like to call the soft brick church design. Soft brick meaning literally the type of brick material that they were made of. They were kind of a, a little more permeable type of brick because they didn't really have a, a more durable, structural, uh, more structurally sound type of brick. That's more what this building is built of from 1910 into 1911. And uh, every church built a kind of a, their first brick buildings looked like this. And the only one of these that even survived was the Old People's Unitarian. Do you remember that down the street? And that one got covered up with stucco created enormous maintenance problems for them later on. They couldn't get to the brick underneath the stucco right there, as a matter of fact. But everybody went to more modern buildings anyway. So uh, let's kind of find out what happened to the Second Street location before we uh, start talking more about Third Street. Here's another early view. Look how Second Street's changing. This is Second Street taken from where the exit is to the Paramount Theater now. And it's looking down Second Street. Notice how the, that's the roof of the church right there. That's first. Look at the, look. It's already starting to come real close to the church. A livery stable. <laughs> The New York Hotel and all this commercial activity, you can see the trees down. This is the harbinger of things to come, and you see like one house left. This is the world at first. So if you can imagine how noisy and noisier it was getting every Sunday morning. You guys had services and so forth because all this increased traffic. This is for an extended streetcar line that's going to go down 2nd Street. And I love this picture. This is right after, this is the same year, just within a month that this 3rd Avenue building opened for First Lutheran Church. There's the old church. Look at that. You see it? There's the church tower. And look at all the downtown that's already surrounding them. Look at all the downtown that's surrounding them. They're building a foundation for a brand new building that would later be called the uh, Lawrence Press Building. Uh, this picture is taken from the Hawk Brothers Building down by the river, looking towards the, uh, uh, towards, uh, the train tracks. 
So this building on the left is still here. This is the old gas company building for many, many years. Right across the street here, it's not built yet, uh, would later be the taller building where now you see Jimmy John's sandwiches downtown, right there. And then uh, this is the back of the old Kenwood House furniture store. You remember this? This was Kenwood House, right next door to the church. And today I brought for you, very special, something none of you I think have ever seen is from the History Center collection. And I want you to come up and take a look at this if you have a moment or two after today. I have an original picture of the church in its final days. You see it right here? Look at that. The second first Lutheran church right there at the time just before they moved out of that location here. Look at the lumber yard in the front there. That's where the bus station is now. So please encourage you to come up and take a look at this. I couldn't get the transfer to the slide right away, but by golly, I found it. I'm bringing this thing down today. <laughs> and we're happy to let you guys use it for your history book and other kinds of things that you're doing um, this week, or this year, I should say. So, And uh, what happened to the second church? I got a lot of chuckles from you. You said, oh, man, our first church got turned into a laundry? Gets worse with the second building. You guys ready for this? <laughs> you might recognize this as the old, what later became the Kenwood House Furniture Store. So over here, where my arrow is pointing, this is where the Paramount Theater is now, looking towards Third Avenue. So this is Second Street, where all these cars are lined up. This part of Second Street doesn't even exist anymore. That's the part they closed off for the bus station and the, uh, the APAC building, the Ground Transportation Center building. They took out that street. Uh, in 1981, and look how there's just a, an old house kind of hanging on next to this commercial building here. Look at that, they built it two inches away from somebody's house. <laughs> this is how downtown expanded and developed, you know. It's like, and if you had a house like that, and your house was built right on the lot line, all of a sudden your north windows are gone. They're just gone. I mean, you don't have any windows anymore right there. I don't think the fire department would ever let something like this happen today, but I still see it sometimes in Chicago sometimes. I'll see this sort of thing happen here. It's a really cool picture because the church was right here. You're thinking, well, wait a minute. I thought you said the church got turned into something else. The church is still here in this picture. That's the church right behind there. See the slope roof? See the eave right here? After First Lutheran moved up here on 3rd Avenue and 10th Street, this area of downtown Cedar Rapids became an early attempt at an automobile row. Before 2nd Avenue became the Lincoln Highway route, and they developed the transcontinental route, this area on 4th Avenue and 2nd Street was a place where people started to build automobile garages, storage buildings, service stations, and so forth, because of the proximity to the new train station down at Green Square. And they thought, ooh, a big old church. They put a brand new, this is all the wider it is, they put a skinny three-story commercial storefront in front of, it literally ripped off the whole front of the old church. And they started parking cars in the church. <laughs> Probably with a load of laundry from the first <laughs> It's a fascinating photograph because it says the Transcontinental Garage. And if you know anything about automobile history in this country, before the Lincoln Highway, if you know anything about Lincoln Highway was the first major highway from New York to California. It was routed through Cedar Rapids. But for a while before that, they called it the Transcontinental Route. So the idea of the early superhighways of America and that specifically dates this to about 1913, which is really, really cool. So I'm afraid that's what happened <laughs> to the, and so it didn't last very long. In fact, they tore down both of these by the 1930s, and then this became kind of an empty lot right next to what later became Kenwood House Furniture. When you used to go to Kenwood House Furniture, you'd park your car right next to the building. You were parking right where the <coughs> church was, between that and the old Metvalsky Fur building that was down there one time. All those years you were parking on the old church site, you didn't even know it. All those years you were getting money at Guarantee Bank. Did you know you were sitting on the church site? So very significant. I just want to make sure you were connect, kind of connected with those two sites. That's just a view of what Cedar Rapids looked like in, in those days, but I just want to kind of... Has everyone got a good sense now of where the original two locations were for First Lutheran? Why don't you guys all come back next week? We're going to make sure we get into the nuts and bolts of what happened here on 3rd Avenue, 10th Street. It's kind of a continuing drama, isn't it? You guys get a lot of drama with your church. Haven't you? But notice how the different developments of Cedar Rapids go hand in hand with your church development. You've been an incredibly important part of the development of the city center in the downtown area. Any quick questions from anyone today? Yes, in the back there. Did you ever have any, was there ever any trouble with the flooding? Um, Did they have trouble with floods? The flooding downtown? They did have flooding downtown, but how many of you were here in the 1993 flood? Was that super deep? 
that's the deepest the floods ever got before 2008. So yeah, we had floods, and it was really more kind of a test of endurance for every generation of Cedar Rapidians. As early as 1851, we'd have these, uh, what we call a 20-foot flood today. And it was one of those things where every 20 or 30 years, we'd have another 20-foot flood. And it was never enough to tear down buildings or destroy things. We'd have to mop out basements and the first floor sometimes. But everyone was just kind of like, well, we'll see another one in 20 or 30 years, and that's just it. And it's interesting because Mother Nature gave us a 20-foot flood for a while there exactly every 32 years. We had a real big one in 1929. 32 years later, it was 1961, we had one. 32 years after that, it was 1993, we had another one. So we were kind of expecting the same thing when 2008 came, right? Except maybe it was another foot or two. What we were supposed to get in 2008 was what we actually got uh, just over a year ago in 2016. It was that 23 foot flood? Uh, but where the second Lutheran church was, uh, it definitely would have been in a bad spot for a flood. There's no doubt about it. Uh, uh, this is much lower elevation. In 2008, this location got 10 feet of water. <laughs> so, but luckily, it, it probably did flood in the 1901 flood. And there would have been enough flooding on 2nd Street to have water in the street only, maybe up to the curb. And uh, if we dig into our first Lutheran church history, there's probably some stories about uh, members of the congregation in 1901 scooping out water out of the basement of the second location down there. Uh, the first location obviously was a little farther away from the river, so there probably wasn't any flooding concerns. And you notice how their basement was raised up quite a bit? Mm -hmm. So that probably was very useful to them. But generally, the 20-foot floods never got to 3rd Street in downtown Cedar Rapids. They usually went to 1st Street and maybe 2nd Street, and certainly down into the Bohemian neighborhood. So uh, what we had in 2008, 10 years ago, was a super flood, obviously. Army Corps of Engineers told me it was a 1 in 2,500 year event. So yes? How deep would the river have been at that time? The river was a little bit deeper because they dredged it, for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was a very different, uh, a very different type of river. Mm -hmm. Although we kind of caused the river to have different behavior when we came here and put railroad tracks in Cedar Lake. Yeah, remember Cedar Lake was a natural extension of the river all the way to Shaver Road, and we human beings decided we we're going to try to tame Mother Nature by creating a railroad yard in Cedar Lake, effectively cutting off the overflow area from the main river. And what else did we do as human beings? We thought down by Riverside Park, where it was a natural place for floodwaters to go to, if you know where the old Pennington Ford and Penford is, we thought, well, let's just build factories on the floodplain down here. Let's just kind of do that. And uh, they also desecrated an old Indian uh, sacred mound there as well. But uh, no flooding. Uh, was well, not probably a serious concern for First Woods in the early years. Yes, question? Were the both of those churches, did they have parsonages? Parson yeah, uh, they did have parsonages, but they, my understanding was they weren't right next to the church structures themselves. They were nearby. I remember, uh, but generally, they, most of the, if you look at the addresses of people who are associated with the church, they generally live in, a, in within five, ten blocks of the area. Don't see any, can I tell you a funny church story about the West Side? <coughs> This is okay on Sunday, but I think it is. It actually, I said this before. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> the churches on the east side, when the west side became West Cedar Rapids, it wasn't Kingston. Everyone on the east side, including First Lutheran Church, noticed that there was only one church on the west side of Cedar Rapids. And it was the United Presbyterian Church. And uh, you know what's the first thing that happened in Cedar Rapids when after Kingston became West Cedar Rapids? Every established East Side church got the idea of starting a mission on the West Side. <laughs> Basically, they felt like the West Side didn't have enough religion. <laughs> and it was time to start building. So, you know, uh, if I have my memory right on this, the earlier Lutheran churches on the West Side are somewhat of spin offs of this church. We've got the German Lutheran, and which became Trinity and some of the other churches over there. Um, we have other churches that spun off here in the east side. But if you look at any church history in Cedar Rapids, uh, the first churches of any denominational faith started in this downtown core area, and everyone felt that they needed to expand their mission, and particularly to the west side, because the west siders themselves are not interested in starting any more of their own churches. It's really kind of interesting. So once that happened, members of, say, for this church, uh, started to live on the west side. They started getting kind of used to the west side. So they're kind of expanding the mission, expanding, the fellowship and so forth. So there's only really very few churches that started uh, homegrown on their own on the West Side. I thought you might find that kind of amusing. So yeah. yes.
Well, blue back there, no, here, yeah. Okay. You mentioned the fire. Yeah. What year was that, and would any of the, like, would your first church have been involved? Or Which fire would, would we refer to? I'm not sure. You mentioned that there was a big fire. Would that have been Baptist church. Oh, the First Baptist Church. I was talking about the First Baptist Church. They had, there, there were some terrible church fires in Cedar Rapids. Luckily, First Lutheran never suffered that, thank goodness. As you saw that first church, that doesn't look like a tinderbox. box. I don't know what it does. You know, man, like, oh, good thing that there was no smoking in there. But anyway, you know, it's one of those things where uh, First Baptist Church, uh, it burned to the ground. It was a beautiful 1893 building designed by the architects who did Bruce Worm. And they just lost the whole thing in 1917. The whole was thing. it brick? It was brick, but it was wood with a brick exterior. And those were not fireproof churches. The second church was not a fireproof structure. This church was designed to be a fireproof church. That's why a lot of churches, uh, leading this, this is a great way to lead into next week, we'll get into more specifics about the journey to 3rd Avenue and 10th Street. But this whole structure, one reason why it's still here after one, nearly 110 years, is because this is part of the new wave of church building to correct a lot of things that were imperfect before. We didn't have fireproof churches, everyone wanted to have a fireproof building. They wanted to go farther out where the congregations were living. 3rd Avenue and 10th Street was considered pretty far out when this was first located in 1910, but they thought they'd have a go at it. The Catholics followed later right across the intersection over there. And um, they wanted bigger buildings, of course. They wanted bigger buildings. But they wanted things that were going to last. And it's a testament to the investment that was put into this original 1910 building that is still here after one of the longest lasting churches uh, in the downtown area. So number three. But it's definitely your best structure. You guys know who the architect of this church is? The original architect? Who's ever heard of Charles Demon? Yeah. Charles Demon. A well known Cedar Rapids architect, designed many other churches, for instance, like St. Wenceslaus, and did many school buildings in Cedar Rapids, like the old Lincoln School, and many, many downtown buildings, like the Lynch Dallas Law Office down here on 2nd Avenue and 6th Street. So this building has an enormously uh, special architect history associated with it, too. And I was here when all of you were opening up your time capsule a few years ago. Uh, the story of the dedication, I'll mention this again next week, so don't keep it too late today. Um, when this cornerstone was dedicated for this church, my favorite story about the dedication of the 3rd Avenue and 10th Street building was, is that in the show of a church's united effort that was already going on in Cedar Rapids in 1909, where no matter what the denominational, uh, denominational faith was, people were getting along as the community of Cedar Rapids religious faith institutions a representative of every other church denomination in Cedar Rapids came to the cornerstone ceremony of this building and brought their own penny. And everybody put their own penny in the time capsule. And Vicki, are you still here? Yeah. Uh, so many other people. When the time capsule was opened a few years ago, and maybe some of you saw it, guess what was inside that time capsule still? A whole bunch of pennies right there. And each of the leaders of those churches put that penny in personally themselves. Inside that. That's how much community support First Lutheran had. And everybody in this community, everyone loved this church, and it was not even 30 years old yet by that point. And um, how important it meant in the hearts of Cedar Rapids community right here. So this is a this was not just a First Lutheran effort. By then, it, people recognized that Cedar Rapids cannot go forward without incredible effort of what First Lutheran does for the community. That's what I love about you guys. A big part of the city. Thank you. So much. Thank you back at the end of the time. Let me know if you have any other questions. I'll stick around for that if you want to. And I uh, hope we see you next week. Are, are you saying that Trinity first movement started? Trinity Scott. I'm just saying that there's a connection. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and um, St. Andrews, too. It is. I'm. I'm the. I'm the running. Oh my God! No. I am too. Yeah. I